All right, let's get started. So hello everyone and uh, kia ora to our attendees from Aotearoa. It's a pleasure to have you all here today at the Infrastructure Sustainability Council's case study webinar. My name is um, Adam Dallas and for those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the Western Australian project managers at the IS Council and I'll be facilitating today's session. Can we move to the next slide, please? Before we begin um, today, I and the IS Council would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. I acknowledge their deep connection to land, water and culture and pay my respects to their elders past and present. For me, that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, now known as Sydney, and I'd encourage all participants to drop in the chat where they are attending from today. Next slide, please. On today's agenda, we have two projects that um, geographically couldn't be further from each other, but have both used the IS rating tool to challenge business as usual and achieve some tremendous innovations on their projects. Our first speakers will be Ed Brees, Ali Hopapa, Marcus Cameron and Tom Shan from the Tiara Tapua Alliance. Um, and the second case study will be presented by Emily Stenmark of GHD from the Tonkin Highway Gap Alignment, uh, Alliance. Uh, finally, we'll round this out with some, some Q&A. Just some light, keeping, light housekeeping regarding that. Could I please ask you to hold off your questions until the end, but place your questions in the chat when they come to you and we'll address them at the end. So, um, and we'll invite all the speakers to, to, to answer those questions. So first off, let me please introduce Ali Hopapa of the Tiara Tapua Alliance. Hi, na mihi. Uh, tēnā rā koutou katoa, no mai hara mai wakatou mai rā, ki rungi te kaupapa o te rā nei. Ko wai au, ko Ali Haupapa taku ingoa, kai tohu tohu ahurea iwi o Te Aratupu Alliance. Uh, he tua tahi, uh, he karakia tīmata, ai o ki te rangi, ai o ki te whenua, Ai o ki te moana, ai o ki ngā tangata katoa, ki hei mauri ora. So welcome everybody. My name is Ali Haupapa and I am the cultural advisor for Te Aratupu Alliance. Um, I just want to give a heartfelt welcome on behalf of Mana Whenua here of Te Aratupu in um, Te Whanganui Ātara, Wellington. I would like to finish with a whakatauki. He whakatauki, whatungaro naro te tangata, toitu he whenua. The importance and permanence of land. While people will come and go, the land remains. As humans, we, re we rely on the land. We must think long term and see the big picture to ensure the sustain sustainability of our land. Nō reira. I would now like to hand over to Ed Brees. Kia ora, Ed. Thank you, Ellie. Hey, uh, just a technical question. Can people see the slides? You have to put that in the chat. Yeah, I can see them, but I think it just needs to move forward, Reshma. So could you skip a couple forward? So... While we're just getting up to, to my slide, which would be, yes, there we go. Next slide, please. Next. Next. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we welcome this opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we do here at the Terra Tapu Alliance. Um, my name's Ed Brees. I'm the Pepsi manager. Uh, I'm not a soft drink merchant. Um, the Pepsi looks after the softer elements of the, the project in this engineering world of planning, partnerships, environment, comms, uh, and under that umbrella comes sustainability. Uh, Te Aratapua Alliance consists of the New Zealand Transport Agency, Waka Kotahi, Downa, Heb, Tonkin and Taylor. And a really important feature of the project is that Mana Whenua are a partner with the New Zealand Transport Agency in the project. Um, and that's why we're blessed with having Ali 
in the team. Uh, the driver for the project is to improve the resilience of the transport networks between Wellington City and the Hutt Valley. Uh, and is also given the opportunity to create a shared path, which gives the, the first time in over 100 years to have safe uh, pedestrian and cycling access between those two key locations. Um, this project's come to escalate. Um, the project got fast-tracked in response to the COVID epidemic and went through a, a fast-track regulatory process. And then in putting it together, the decision was committed to, to go for ISC certification. Um, so some of the benefits in the early planning we didn't really have, um, but we're not letting that be a hurdle to us and we're our best endeavours to um, score as highly we can and what we can score in. Uh, and so it's a great pleasure to, to talk to or show what we're doing in the innovation credit area. Um, before I hand over to Tom, I just also just like a special thanks to Erin and our team who has put this all together for us today. And thank you. Oh, thank you, Ed. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Tom Shan toko ingoa. I am the Coastal Engineering Design Lead on the Te Aratupa Alliance. So we're coming to you today to talk about several sustainability innovations um, from two different aspects. The first, which I'll talk to, are the X Block Plus armour units being used along the, the edge of the project. And the second, which Marcus will talk on after me is around the reef enhancement um, aspects. So for the X Block Plus, we're going to be talking about three, focusing on three particular aspects. Um, the use of a single layer pattern placed concrete armor unit as the primary revetment armor. And so for this particular unit, this is an Australasian first, the ecological and the architectural um, modifications, which is a world first to be used on these type of units, and then the multi-model testing and design approach for, for seismic performance, which is, is, a, is a world first. Uh, next slide, please. So we took over the project um, with a design that was over the consented footprint um, and required a very large volume of armor rock. And this is a problem around Wellington because it's so seismically active, the rock's very fractured. So it's hard to get large, large rock. Um, and being over the consented footprint was a major issue as well because all of the, the compensation packages, et cetera, the effects assessment had been based on a specific area. Um, so our challenge was to get back into the consented footprint and to reduce the the, um, the large volumes of armor rock required. Click, please. So what we ended up looking at was a variety of alternatives to rock. Um, and where we landed was on a single layer pattern placed concrete armor unit. These particular units, the X Block Plus units are developed by Delta Marine Consultants in the Netherlands. And they are, uh, I guess, a progression or an innovation from a, a previous unit that has been used um, once before in Australia and in New Zealand. Click, please. So these units um, interlock with each other. So when they're placed, they interlock with the units in front and they're, interlock and they're locked by the units behind. And that provides a lot more stability when they get hit by waves. And that enables much smaller units to be used um, compared to rock, but also a single layer rather than the usual double layer of rock. Um, and so that, that ends up meaning that we use a, a much smaller, smaller total volume um, and, it, and it reduces the footprint. So this is the first time these X block plus units have been used in Australasia, and it's the fourth time that they've been used internationally. Um, so switching over to these units ended up reducing cost. While the concrete is more expensive than the rock, um, we use much less of it, and it doesn't have to be transported nearly as far. So we reduced cost, we reduce program because they're much quicker and safer to place than rock, um, and the, the total embodied carbon content compared to rock was slightly better, mainly due to the, the lower amounts of transport um, and also the, the shorter construction time frame. 
Next slide, please. So the X block revetment started out as a very uniform pattern, which the Dutch love that it's very clean, it's very um, um, very sharp, um, and they really designed it for this property. Next slide, please. But that it didn't really that didn't really work on our project, where it's all around about integrating with the surrounding landscape, um, and I guess reconnecting that landscape and the people to the to the ocean, to the harbour, to Honganui Atawa. And so our um, landscape architects got involved. Next slide, please. And they modified these units. So they modified the form of them, the size of them, the color of them, at the same time retaining those interlocking characteristics. And so after they had finished this design exercise, next slide, please, we ended up with a, a much more natural looking revetment that blended into the adjacent rocky headlands, the uranga or landing points, and into the landscape behind. Next slide, please. Um, so while the X-Block reduced the seabed footprint, the pro overall project still had a, um, a, a total footprint of around five hectares. And so several environmental compensation measures were put in place. And Marcus will talk to those a little more um, in a couple of slides. But one of these included enhanced surface area across the three and a half or um, ac across three and a half thousand meters squared of X block um, X block area so the below tide uh, X block and this was really designed to increase the surface complexity and resemble the habitat that would be lost um, in this case rocky reef and the features of a kelp holdfast was used to develop those more complex um, surface areas combined with that to Whanganui Atawa or Wellington Harbour has great cultural, historical, and spiritual significance for iwi mana whenua. The project provides an opportunity to acknowledge and promote that cultural narrative and the traditional stories and to share with this with their people and with the wider community. So the ecological enhancement was integrated with a cultural narrative designed by um, local cultural artist Len Hetet, um, specifically Te Akumi and Te Arona, the incoming and outgoing tides. And so these sort of dual modifications came together and then they were modified iteratively with the designers, the precasters and the construction team to ensure that they could be ta uh, that they could be cast and that their units retain those interlocking characteristics that were key to actually letting us use them in the first place. Next. So, uh, sorry. So it's a world that was a world first modification for, for these blocks. Um, and I can't see the bottom of it. Something's just out of screen. Um, and I think the first to include, first of any blocks like this to include a cultural narrative, which was really special for the project. Next slide, please. So construction over a large active fault line caused some unique issues. No one has tested the behavior of these type of units during seismic activity. So when they get shaken, will they sort of pop off and will they lose that interlocking that lets us use them in the first place? Um, and there's no established methods to determine this, and there's no models that will um, take into account all the different processes. So the shaking, the behavior of the blocks, the behavior of the ground and soil behind. Um, and so we had to sort of derive something that would tell us what would happen, um, how the blocks would look after a particular event, whether they would still perform as intended, and then how would we would get in there and, re and repair them. Uh, click please. So we developed a sort of a multi-model approach to test, understand, and develop solutions. So first, we recreated the revetment on a physical shake table. So we could put through a design earthquake to see how the um, to see how the blocks would respond. The problem is that these shake tables are only capable of shaking in one in one direction. Um, so we use that. Maybe if you click back one. Rishma, can you click back one, please? Uh, then one forward. Yes. Um, we took that into um, the Unreal Engine, which is a gaming engine, but it replicates physics, which is what we needed to do here. And we were able to essentially shake the revetment in three dimensions, first calibrating it to what we saw in the physical model. And from that, we saw 
the unit start to deform. Let me play that again. It just skipped on my screen anyway. So the unit started to deform. And then we could take both how the units looked at the end of the shaking. Uh, just back a couple. Yep. So we could use how the units looked at the end of the shaking together with some standard geotechnical testing of slope stability. It's okay, just let it play. Um, and then we put that into a physical model. So into a hydraulic flume here at UNSW in Sydney, and we hit it with our sort of an annual storm event. So this was saying what happens if before we can get it and repair it, we get hit by a storm. And so from that, we knew that there would be some damage. We knew that it performed acceptably during a design storm, and we could come up with a, a repair mechanism to get in, unpack it, repair the slope, and repack it. And that gave us confidence that even with a design earthquake in the seismic actively area, the um, the revetment would still perform um, acceptably. And so this is the first time that we know of that this combination of physical and numerical approaches, including this this gaming engine um, has been used for this this type of assessment. Uh, so that's me, Kia ora Koto. Thanks for having me, and I'll pass over to my colleague Marcus Cameron. Thanks, Tom. Kia ora Koto, ko Marcus Cameron, Takuingoa. I'm the marine ecology lead for the reef enhancement component of the project. Um, this is a really cool, innovative, uh, new approach to dealing with um, ecological effects and compensation in New Zealand. And just to give an overview of what was done, we'll play this little intro video clip. We may have to just, yeah, jump out into YouTube um, to play it. Thanks, Reshma. We may not have audio, so we'll just run with the subtitles. Oh, if we just jump out of YouTube, Reshma, and next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry, it's just taking one second to load. Just back one, that's it. Thanks, Reshma. Um, so, yeah, why was ecological compensation needed as part of this project? Um, Tom alluded to it in his presentation. But effectively, there was a permanent loss of five hectares of high-value marine habitat due to the build. And that lost habitat was a mosaic of rocky outcrops, boulders and sand. And it was being replaced with rock revetment, seawalls and offshore rocky habitats. But this didn't um, compensate for the very high residual ecological effects of um, a high value habitat being lost. 
So various compensation options were considered, uh, including um, structural stormwater treatment, um, muscle restoration, but ultimately the reef enhancement was considered to be the best option. Next slide, please, Rishima. Cheers. So why was it considered to be the best option? Well, it's a widely used nature-based uh, solution globally, although not really in New Zealand at any scale. There's a strong track record of this type of enhancement, improving marine biodiversity and habitat limited areas. It has similar successional development um, and food and shelter provisioning resources to natural reefs. And a range of ecosystem services are provided, such as water filtration, carbon sequestration, etc. And it's um, importantly as similar to what is being lost as possible. So a little bit about the, the technology behind this. So the units are produced by MMA Offshore, which is a, an Australian company. Um, they're very experienced with this in Australia and uh, beginning to be around the world. Um, this is the first one in New Zealand, as you might have seen in the earlier slide. They produce a range of different modules. Uh, you can see in the top right there, there's the Abitat, the Apollo, and the Bombora. They're a bit smaller. They're, you know, one to two metres. Um, and they're kind of designed more to provide um, benthic habitat in, in rockier or hard bottom areas. We've got quite soft sediment in this area, so we needed to get up above that and provide vertical relief. So we ended up going for these pyramid units. Um, they're four by four metres, uh, five metres high, and they're particularly designed to um, create habitat for fish. And you can see there, they create an upwelling situation, which um, brings food into the uh, line of sight of the fish that can sit in above the units there. So we've ended up with uh, 54 of these pyramid units. It covers an area of five hectares. And we used ecological design to come up with 18 clusters of three units, which are within a few meters of each other. And then each of those clusters needs to be within 50 meters of the next cluster. You can see the layout on the right-hand side there. Next slide, please, Rishma. And this is what we hope to see. So these are a number of common species that we have in Te Whanganui Atara. Um, and we expect to see most, hopefully all, of these um, as the reef develops over time. Um, and that's an example of them being deployed in a site in Australia. Um, if we jump, next slide. Just wanted to note that this is also part of a wider compensation package. So it involves uh, seaweed translocation of uh, Macrocystis, which is a threatened species in New Zealand, top right there. And it also includes funding for research opportunities with Victoria University and with Mana Whenua. And those uh, hoping to include cultural components could include biosecurity and also adaptive management. There's a five-year um, well-funded monitoring program, and that includes both Western science and also cultural monitors and cultural indicators. And that's uh, Auntie Ellie there on the left-hand side. She's one of our cultural monitors. Um, it also includes the revetment, um, as Tom described, and that also includes, on top of the Xbox Plus, these um, eco-enhanced, eco-concrete tide pools as well, which you can see over on the right there. Um, so that's that's a product out of uh, out of Israel, out of eco-concrete, and it also includes some dune restoration. So it's quite a comprehensive uh, compensation package. And where are we at? Uh, we've just completed the baseline monitoring about a month ago. We've got pyramid units currently being fabricated and deployed. And as of yesterday, we had 15 of the pyramid units in the water, and almost all of them have been fabricated now. The um, contractors expect to complete the deployment in June, and then we'll have a first monitoring round post-deployment six or seven months after um, they have all been deployed in February, March next year. So what are the sustainability outcomes that we've achieved? For the reef enhancement, we're uh, expecting that increased biodiversity through providing a high value habitat type that's currently limited in Te Whanganui Atara. We managed to achieve minimal seabed impact. So we reduced the footprint when compared to using something like piles of rock or a larger number of smaller units by using the large units with a smaller footprint. We're providing multiple ecosystem services, carbon sequestration through 
kelp, seaweed, shellfish growth, and also water filtration, and importantly, food provisioning. And we're enabling mana whenua to exercise their kaitiaki, or guardianship, over Te Whanganui Atara. And I can potentially hand back to Tom at this point to just run through the sustainability outcomes for the Xbox. Sure. Thanks, Marcus. So for the Xbox Plus units, we were able to reduce the quantity of embodied carbon emissions. Um, we had a lower volume of armour rock needed, uh, of armour needed when compared to rock. We had a significant reduction in heavy transport movements throughout the lower North Island. Um, we had a faster construction program and a safer and more efficient um, placement methodology and also methodology for post-event repair. It's much easier to go in and unpick blocks um, rather than, than much larger rock. We had improved uh, ecological outcomes um, through the, the surface enhancements and similar to the reef enhancement, we enable mana whenua to exercise kaitiaki over Te Whanganui Atawa. So thanks for having us. I'll uh, hand back to Ellie at this point. Hi, uh, kia ora no e te iwi, nei rā te mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ke karakia whakamutunga, so this is a kar closing karakia, and it basically means, aio ki te rangi, peace to the sky, aio ki te whenua, peace to the land, aio ki te moana, peace to the moana, aio ki ngā tangata katoa, peace to all mankind. Thanks for that. Um, I'd now like to introduce Emily Stenmark of the Tonkin Gap project to discuss some of the innovations that they employed on their projects. I'd again, encourage everyone to keep popping those questions in the chat um, and we'll address them at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, and thanks, Danielle and ISC for uh, inviting me to speak with you guys today. So my name is Emily Stenmark. I'm a sustainability consultant uh, with GHD. And for the last seven years, I've been working across planning, design, and construction as a major infrastructure projects, both in WA, uh, here in Perth, where I'm based, uh, also in the Northern Territory. So I've been involved with the Token Gap project and associated work for the last three and a half years as the sustainability lead, um, generally looking after that sort of day-to-day -day integration with the design and construction teams, um, as well as, of course, preparing the um, uh, submissions for the IS rating for design and construction um, as built rating, which is currently going through verification. So today I'm going to be running through the four Australia first innovations that we've achieved um, and have verified so far in the Tonkin Gap, give you a bit of an idea of what we did uh, and some of the outcomes and challenges. I don't have anyone joining me today, so I'll do my best with the with the technical aspects. Um, but yeah, we'll see how we go. Next slide, please. So the Tonkin Gap Alliance is like to acknowledge that we are constructing and operating on Wajat Noongar Buja in and around the Devil Yerrigan, which is an important um, listed heritage site, and we pay our respects to elders past and present. Next slide. So similarly, this project uh, was fast tracked. It was a COVID fast track project, so we had very limited planning that had been undertaken when our alliance was formed back in uh, mid 2020. Um imagine not a lot of you are familiar with the Tonkin Gap project in WA, but um, it's essentially being delivered by the Tonkin Gap Alliance, which consists of Giorgio, CMD, WA Limestone, GHD, and BGE. &E. Uh, and we have widened the Tonkin Highway between Dunrace Road and Collier Road and um, beyond, uh, addressing a major bottleneck, it's approximately 10 kilometres of highway there. Uh, we've got new bridges in multiple locations across the alignment, as well as footbridges, pedestrian underpasses, and then the associated works um, portion of our job was delivering the rail enabling works for the Metronet Morley Allenbrook line, which included underpasses, dive structures, um, and deconstruction and reconstruction of the new Brunav Bridge for a bus interchange, uh, along with a, 
uh, principal share path, which is running all the way along Tonkin Highway and connecting to the, the north and southern uh, connection points. Next slide, please. So I guess on Tonkin Gap, we had a, a number of contributing processes that were established very, all, very, very early on um, in the alliance formation that existed all the way through sort of design and construction. And I've sort of split these into design and construction considerations. Um, I guess the value engineering, uh, which was a very fundamental process to our identification uh, and early kind of implementation of initiatives in, in that design phase. It involved a lot of our construction team as well to look at optimization of, of construction methodology along with those kind of design changes. So we ran a number of workshops with many different disciplines looking at a broad range of opportunities in those very early stages as we were developing a, a very mature sort of design and looking at multiple different options to solve some of the uh, challenges that we had in front of us. Uh, bringing construction reps into the mix also allowed us to explore some of those construction. Uh, can you go back, please? Next slide. Thank you. Um, just associated with the design and considering, um, like I said, that construction methodology, flight and equipment required from that fuel burn perspective. We adopted uh, an options assessment kind of tool, a bespoke MCA that we used to assess over 30 um, design and construction initiatives. Um, this tool features uh, a range of non-financial criteria, technical criteria, as well as that whole of life costing that uh, we could put, you know, in front of the in front of the client in terms of creating business cases and things for uh, opportunities that required a little bit more effort. Um, and we also selected a number of items from that value engineering register to sort of run through our decision tool um, and focus on a number of different outcomes. In terms of the construction and through procurement, um, we had our commitment to sustainable procurement, which was provided to all tenderers through uh, what well, the entire the entire length of the project uh, and program uh, as part of all that kind of documentation that you'll provide to tenderers, so scope and specifications as well communicating our sustainability targets and, and general expectations, I guess, to drive continuous improvement and, and outcomes uh, in innovation or resource efficiency, uh, industry sustainability, things like that. Um, so our procurement evaluation was, again, like an MCA tool that was specifically based on procurement um, objectives um, and that was able to, like I said, sort of drive outcomes through ongoing supplier engagement. Thank you. Next slide. So, yeah, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we've had four Australia First uh, innovations verified as part of design and and, um, and as built. And I'm just going to dive into each of them um, somewhat briefly, I guess. But, yeah, let's jump to the next one. So, I'll first. Um, first innovation was this permanent precast barrier system. Um, so these constant slope barriers are typically constructed using a concrete extrusion machine. Uh, these are known as slip form barriers. So the machine will travel along the road uh, where a low slumping concrete mix is pushed through the mould. So that will form the barrier shape as the machine kind of moves along, um, placing the tension strand cables into that concrete uh, moulding. It generally requires two adjacent traffic lanes to be shut during construction, uh, which obviously requires a lot of traffic management and often night work. Um, this is a very high volume highway that we're talking about. Um, so that was obviously a, the time and cost in terms of traffic management was a big consideration in where this idea kind of was born. It's also very expensive to apply this type of barrier system a typical barrier system to short lengths due to the cost of transferring and mobilising the extrusion machinery. Um, and there's also significant volumes of run on and run off or waste concrete as the conforming sections are cast. So this initiative was led by our design interface manager who developed a permanent formwork system utilising these precast uh, 
uh, concrete facing panels to construct that constant slope sort of rigid barrier that, that we require. Um, <clears throat> the TJA barrier system is comprised of, of these thin, thin precast panels and they're held apart by an internal bracing which provides the structural form um, and holds that high tension strand as well that, that's required to be installed. They're really lightweight and they're delivered pre-fabricated to site where they can just be craned into place um, and they're linked together in a very similar way to uh, like a temporary barrier system. Uh, so we had tried, uh, applied this as a bit of a trial to 950 metres um, of barrier along the new bridge that was constructed over the uh, Swan River or Double Yerrigan. So some of the outcomes from this um, really was around the construction methodology and equipment that was required for installation. So that was around 150 kilolitres of diesel that was saved just due to that faster installation time um, and, and just reduced kind of equipment that's required. Um, the concrete runoff as well that was saved from this methodology was approximately 30 lengths of this runoff over the 950 metre barrier. That was about 108 cubes of concrete waste as well that we were able to eliminate from casting in a controlled uh, yard, which is about 40, overall about 480 tonnes of carbon. Uh, and then there was, of course, a significant reduction uh, in the disruption to users from limiting the traffic closures and disruptions. So ultimately minimising impacts to, to road users during the construction. Probably the, the main challenge for us was around the methodology, just that change requiring approval from the client. So there was minor hesitation, which was purely based around the performance and possible maintenance requires, so requirements. So if the shells like delaminated from that kind of in situ concrete that's poured in, um, potentially that that would require additional, additional maintenance. So we just followed the standard sort of process for approval, pro providing our designs, ongoing engagement with um, with our client main roads, and um, we also prepared a maintenance plan to put um, put, a, put all the requirements in there. Uh, there was some kind of technical challenges as well that required our design and construction teams to alter the design of, of one length of the barrier, so essentially run on, on run on both sides of this new bridge, uh, or part of the new bridge and part of an old bridge that was adjacent to it. Um, and, and this was really just that on that existing bridge, there was no existing sort of foundation for barriers and the required noise, noise walls that we had to construct. So we made alterations to the design to accommodate the noise walls within the, within the barrier itself. I'll jump to the next slide. Thank you. So this next, back one. Thank you. So this next one uh, was really a bit of a joint effort with one of our um, NOx partners, the WA Limestone. They're a, a constructor and um, material supplier in WA and they had an existing relationship with Avertis Energy who are involved with bringing one of the first waste energy plants um, to WA. So the incinerator bottom ash aggregate is a byproduct from these waste energy plants. Um, and we worked with them to essentially use this aggregate in a, in a bound kind of block form uh, with mixed with recycled construction demolition waste to replace uh, sort of typical limestone retaining wall blocks. Um, WA Limestone had already completed a lot of the heavy metals analysis and leach testing um, being a bound kind of application definitely made this a little bit easier in terms of approval um, because this is a new um, product to WA uh, or really Australia um, in terms of actually using this waste product. So Avertis have a contract with Blue Phoenix who are the world leader in, in IBA and I guess because we don't have a lot of that best practice and templates around how to use this product there was a lot of kind of ongoing engagement with, with those officers in the UK for, for guidance around use and, and things like that. So the main 
benefits of this is really um, around that resource efficiency, circular economy kind of space. Although the trial was quite small, uh, we only really imported 40, uh, 40 blocks, just as a sort of small trial. The quantity of the byproduct that's used in the construction of a single IBA block is equivalent to about 105 standard 240 litre um, general waste bins. So based on what we did in Port for Tonkin Gap, this was around 3,700 uh, bins, which is equivalent to 73 household waste for, for a year. So on a, on a big scale, you can imagine um, the kind of benefit in terms of waste to landfill, which is where this aggregate um, would typically end up. IBA also has a bulk density of about 75% uh, of many other aggregates that are typically used in blocks. Limestone blocks are, are WA's favourite thing. So uh, less water is required uh, during the formation of the block, that you get more volume per tonne, so on a larger scale, um, less truckloads and, and, of course, associated transport emissions. And then um, I guess the waste to energy plants themselves could be considered an urban quarry, so you are reducing that haulage and associated uh, emissions from from transporting from you know quarries that are a little bit further outside of urban areas. In Perth, we've got two waste energy plants that are reaching commissioning later this year. So um, I guess the, the the main driver behind this was test the product, um, get the main roads WA uh, comfortable with it and the application of it. Um, to hopefully drive that market demand up into the future. Um, I guess in terms of challenges, there was really only the issue of, of strength um, as these required a deviation from main road specification, which is really around the calcium carbonate continent, the continent content. So our materials and engineering branch signed off on that. As I mentioned, uh, a lot of that environmental um, and strength testing had already been completed. So it was uh, actually a, a pretty streamlined and quick process to, to get this up and running. Um, the variation in color as well. So obviously the limestone blocks that you typically see are that kind of yellow color. These are a little bit darker gray. So we weren't able to use them as road facing blocks. Um, but apart from that, um, yeah, pretty pretty straightforward, I guess, in terms of, of implementation. I'll jump to the next one. Thank you. Uh, and this one's really, really similar um, in terms of how the trial kind of came about. These were proposed as two different types of blocks. We imported about the same amount. Again, it was um, in partnership with, with one of our NOPS um, partners. Um, and they were doing some work with covalent lithium to undertake trials of, of using this delithiated beta spodamine, which is a co-product from lithium processing. Um, it, VBF on its own uh, doesn't really have a lot of cementitious value, but when uh, mixed with water and in this sort of very finely divided form, it reacts chemically with the calcium hydroxide, which then creates a lot of that cementitious cementitious property, so not having to use as much um, cement and binder for the block. It was about 25% DBS, with the rest of it then being as well recycled construction and, and demolition waste. Some of the outcomes, again, it's, it's more around that resource efficiency space, reduction in virgin materials and reducing our potential waste to landfill. Um, and I guess in the Perth area, we've got, again, covalent lithium opening their first refinery, I believe, early next year. So, again, key benefit of this trial uh, was really around increasing awareness of the product, um, making the comfortable client for that future implementation, again, in a bound application, but also just that familiar familiarity uh, and hopefully increasing market demand where this product is going to be massively available come 2025. Um, and very similarly, again, with the challenges, it was just around that strength testing, environmental leaching and things, which was all undertaken um, by WA Limestone 
as part of the alliance um, and that colour variation as well, which just meant that we had to use them as, as backing blocks and, and non-road facing blocks. So final slide. Thank you. Um, so this was um, a, a real design and construction kind of collaboration. It was identified very, very early on. Um, the scope of our project included the construction of a new bridge over the Derbal Yerrigan to sort of carry Tonkin Highway northbound. And this was constructed adjacent to that existing bridge that included four piers, um, two of these which uh, had direct interface with the river and riverbed. Um, and in order to launch the bridge deck, bridge deck over the span between these piers, uh, we had initially identified that we would require a um, temporary pier to be constructed in the river to support the 31 metre long launching girder, which is what you can see in, in the photos there. Um, the design decision was identified as part of uh, our value engineering, which I sort of spoke to as a key opportunity um, to sort of optimise um, both the design, but mainly around the construction methodology and how we were to build this bridge. Uh, we looked at a number of different options using our decision-making tool and assessed it for environmental um, resource kind of impacts as well as social and heritage aspects uh, and I guess cost as well of course with the whole of life costing. Through this investigation we identified an opportunity to remove the temporary pier by extending the existing girder, fixing another girder to the end of it which was done in a collaborative effort with um, a steel uh, manufacturer and supplier and Fresne, who owned one of uh, the girders that we were using. Um, and they fixed and strengthened the girder to a total length of 53 metres. So the bridge was constructed in 18 incremental launches uh, and the increased length of that girder allowed us to reach the uh, supporting permanent pier on the other side of the river whilst maintaining that kind of counterweight. So we were able to completely remove um, that temporary peer requirement. There was a lot of engagement that was undertaken with DBCA, who are a local environmental regulator and traditional owners, uh, our traditional owner working group. Um, but I mean, overall, this approach was, was really well received by all of the stakeholders just due to the bus range of kind of benefits, both environmentally and, and socially. Um, some of these outcomes did include uh, overall that improved construction methodology, reducing impacts on the Derbal Yerrigan, which is a, a heritage wood site. We've eliminated the riverbed dredging um, that would have been required for the pile cap construction, prevented permanent impacts to the riverbed as well from, from the piling and steel that would have um, had to permanently remain in the riverbed and then avoiding disturbance to sediment and water quality impacts caused by a temporary barge that would have been traveling back and forth to that pier throughout the entire construction program. Um, better energy efficiency, so we saved around 23 kilolitres of fuel from both the piling rigs and the barge operation um, and saved 25 um, tonnes of steel for the piling as well and really positive kind of community sentiment through minimising not just impacts to the heritage site, but also those impacts to recreational users through, through construction. Um, and really, I guess with this, the main challenge for us was in actually connecting the two girders and, and fixing them together. We had to do a lot of additional design work um, in terms of the approach, um, and just managing the complexity of working with such a long, um, long girder, just managing, I guess, that counterweight and things. So bulking them together did present some challenges. Um, I guess just in, in these girders are reused again and again. So any kind of minor kink um, did present some challenges in that fixing. But overall, a little bit of additional work up front um, which really drove this to be incredible, incredibly successful um, in throughout the whole uh, construction process. I think that's uh, that's my last slide. Hope that was enough time. That was thanks, thanks Emily. And I know at least um, 
John in the chat agrees with me. He said, fantastic uh, showcase of circular economy. Super impressive. So John and I are on board. Um, I'd like to invite all the other speakers to to flick their cameras back on and their, their microphones. So we'll run through some questions. The first, I'm going to combine a couple because they're, they're all asking the same things and it'll be for the Tiara to Poa team. I'm not sure who, who will answer it, but... Um, People are curious as to whether the the X blocks were imported from from the Netherlands or if they were cast locally in New Zealand. Thanks, Adam. I can probably take that one. Um, no, the Nether the Netherlands connection is that they were invented by a Dutch um, Dutch firm. They were actually invented to use on their Ashfordyke, um, the upgrade of the Ashfordyke to for similar reasons to reduce um, rock requirements. So we um, first we construct the molds, um, the, the the steel formwork ourselves, um, based on drawings, and so um, that's quite an intricate process, particularly for these type of units, um, and with those ecological, cultural um, aspects to it. So we have, I think, twenty four of those produced, and but once that they're made, um, they're producing them all at a precast yard in Otaki, just north of Wellington. Um, so they produce essentially one a day. They're, they're pouring it and then striking it, and the next day lifting it, lifting it off, and then they bring them down to site um, on trucks. Okay, thanks. And, and following on from that as well, um, a, a two-pronged question. Uh, was there any difficulty in finding concrete suppliers to produce them? And and with that as well, were you able to test kind of varying levels of um, supplementary cementious product in, in the blocks? No, it was, they're, they're actually a very simple concrete specification. So there was nothing difficult about what we needed to produce according to the spec. So no problems finding concrete suppliers. The batching plant is right next door to the precast yard conveniently. Um, and but no, we also didn't. We haven't tried any um, particular modifications to the to the mix um, to adjust that. So it is just a standard twenty five. Well, actually, they might have upped it thirty five MPA concrete mix. Thanks. Um, next one for you, Emily. Uh, what were the specific? Oh, maybe you don't have to go too far into the specifics. But what were some of the challenges that you faced from an environmental approval perspective using uh, both the IBAA and the DBS blocks. Oh, hang on, you're muted, Emily. We're not getting any sound coming through. I'm sorry, I had to. I had to dial in on my phone, so I keep forgetting. Um, it looks like I'm not muted. Um, yeah, we actually, we actually didn't really have too many issues at all with this. It didn't require any kind of additional approval, really, beyond um, just the client. So we had some sort of leaching testing undertaken by WA Limestone in sort of partnership. So they were doing um, testing of, of both the blocks just to check, um, yeah, that kind of leaching component. Um, but because it's a bound application, there wasn't really that much concern that there would be significant issues with that. So yeah, I guess overall, there wasn't really that many challenges. It was just that we had to undertake that testing um, provided the results that was done by um, an external party and provided those results to to the client and they were they were pretty comfortable with with all of that to be honest so it wasn't yeah wasn't too much of a challenge all right thanks I might um two questions now for for Marcus um so I'll get them both out and then you could answer them if you could so did you do a carbon assessment for the loss and gain of the ecological areas on the project and then following on from that, were the larger reef structures manufactured in New Zealand um, or were they imported from Australia? Yeah, so for the first question, not specifically a carbon calculation, but what we used, which was also a, a New Zealand first for subtitle habitat, was what we call the biodiversity compensation model. So it's not a full offset accounting model. Um, it's a semi-quantitative model. And so we input all of the, the different habitats uh, and their values and um, factor in timescales for recovery. And then it comes out with some numbers that say this is the quantum of, of compensation that you need to, um, to compensate for that loss. 
So we we have done our, our losses and gains, but not uh, not specifically from a carbon perspective. It's more from a broader ecological perspective. And the second question, yes, they are being manufactured in New Zealand. So uh, the moulds are MMA moulds, which have been brought in from Australia and then working with a local contractor, Brian Perry Civil, um, to do the casting in their yard. And they're also doing the deployment. So that's been a good carbon saving, um, being able to do that all locally. And also there was a bit of optioneering around where the units were going to be cast and, and therefore the travel distance um, for the units to come. And the yard location that we've ended up with is pretty much as close as you can get to the site. So that has reduced the carbon footprint of the deployment of the blocks as well. Thank you. Um, Emily, we'll jump back to you again with the... Um... Enviro considerations for the for the blocks. Um, was there much feedback from from Dewa around the leaching uh, or the pollution potential of the products? Um, no, not really. So, I mean, the, there was the the heavy metals analysis um, that was done as part of the testing and the leaching. It it didn't really show that there would be. It showed that there would be no risk essentially so I mean, like I said there, there just wasn't really much of an environmental concern at all obviously if we're talking about unbound applications so using either of these products as still there's you know ongoing work that's happening in, in that regard but just due to where we were placing them um, being in a bound application like that it's kind of considered no different to um, recycled construction demolition waste which we we use in those different kinds of applications all the time Thanks. And and uh, in regards to where you were placing them, were they used for structural or, or non-structural areas of the projects? Uh, there were retaining walls um, along the highway. So, yeah. Uh, one, one retaining wall. We only had, there was only 75 blocks in total that were used. So very small trial, um, but yeah, just used in, in one, one retaining wall along the highway. Thanks. Um, I think we've exhausted all of the questions from the chat. So unless anyone wants to throw one in now, I might just start by thanking all of the presenters. So Emily from the Tonkin Gap and then everyone from Tiara Tapua, um, the ISC really, um, well, I've got, um, really uh, would like to thank you for, for your great contributions to them. One more housekeeping from me as well is that afterwards you'll be asked to contribute um, uh, from a, a survey just about how you thought the, the, um, this went. And if you could please fill that out, that would be great. And I've got a question. Um, maybe Reshma or Danny could, could answer. Will the slides be shared after the presentation? I might have to get back to you on that one, Leslie. Um, and then we have had one other person jump in. So is there a plan on what to do with the steel X block molds at the end of the project? That might have to be the final one as well. Oh, maybe, maybe Ed should jump in on this one. I imagine that, um, I'm not, yeah, I imagine though they will stay in New Zealand certainly and be looking for either another home or another project to be producing X block for. We've got a lot of, um, areas in need that are that are subject to erosion and protecting infrastructure that need protection and, and rock armor, um, particularly large rock armor is particularly scarce. So I'm sure we will find um, another project um, to use them on in the future. Great, thanks. And I was being told that we will be sharing the slides afterwards. So um, you'll be getting an email after that. But I think that closes out our proceedings for today. So thanks for everyone for attending. Thanks for thanks to all the presenters and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.